Hello. So we're going to talk today about knowing and supporting your learners. Um, dive a little into differentiation and how to support uh, different learners. Let's start by taking a look at this class. When you see this group of, of students, what kinds of things do you notice? The details are right there. All these different learners doing different things, enjoying different activities, <laughs> and the teacher looks happy. So one has to ask yourself, you know, has he designed his classroom this way or is this just happening? Why is it that teachers freak out whenever you mention differentiation? The truth of the matter is, is that differentiation is just good teaching. And um, like so many things, uh, we stopped just calling it good teaching and we started calling it differentiation. And it got associated with special ed in, in teachers' minds and um a lot of people see that as some sort of, um, you know, uh, really scary area. They're they're worried that they'll they'll hurt a kid, um, you know, hurt a kid's learning, or or become more of a stumbling block than a help. And I mean, it's really just fear that that keeps um, teachers from from looking into differentiation. The truth of the matter is. Most of them are differentiating already um, because they have diverse classrooms and their students are learning. So we know it's going on, uh, but they still get freaked out because they don't understand what we mean by that term. You may have seen that yourself in your uh, schools that you visited. And when we're talking about differentiation, what we're really doing is just talking about helping people do um what everybody else is doing so for example if i was if i was teaching a class and i was walking down the class and and i dropped uh dropped something um and you know here i am kind of old and crippled up um one of my students would probably lean over and pick it up for me uh, often they pass out papers and that sort of thing to help me out uh, because it's it's clear that I have some uh, movement problems. So uh, that's just a, a human nature. So, you know, it's no big deal to take um, these three boxes and give them to the person who needs them so that everybody can see. So it, equality kind of means offering everyone the same thing, whereas equity, people don't have the same thing but they get the same experience. So we're not talking about equality in what we give students. We're talking about equity. When I taught school, um, I, um, let's go down memory lane, yeah. Uh, when I taught school, and it wasn't 500 years ago, I know you may think it was, I retired from um uh, K-12 teaching uh, permanently in 2013. So that's not been a hundred years. Um, so when I when I was uh, teaching K-12, uh, what I did was that I tried to use as many different strategies as I could. And I would try to teach the content in as many different ways as I could. I'd had a a, a, a teacher, a veteran teacher along the way that told me, you got to teach things three times. And if you really wanted to get it to where they'll learn it, you got to teach things three, three times and three ways. And that really stuck with me. And so I got in the habit early on of trying to teach things um, three times, three ways. And um, I, I sort of started using a lot of graphic organizers, and I learned about guided notes. I used those a lot. Would get out the art supplies often uh, to find little um, songs and jingles. Uh, I still have students today uh, that will, you know, who are grown up, and they'll say, "I remember learning this song in your class," and 
and uh, I would come up with a lot of examples and metaphors, analogies. I still try to do that. Um, I would frequently give uh, formative assessments. So I, I learned early on that I needed to monitor and adjust my instruction as I was teaching. So I would give kind of an informal assessment, see if they were getting it. If they weren't, I would kind of adjust my instructions as I needed. And that's a, that's a way to differentiate your instruction. Um, I uh, would, you know, try to vary presentation and materials, not just do the same thing all the time. Gradual release of responsibility model. We didn't have a name for it when I was teaching at the, uh, at the beginning, but it was something that I knew to do. And, of course, um, uh, the Madeline Hunter model greatly influenced me um, in a lot of my um, middle years is what I call them. And... You know, always being aware and mindful of the specific accommodation that some special needs students do have to have. So there is a continuum of differentiation. It's, no one's completely, like, fully differentiated. When you talk about a perfect classroom, I'm not sure you've got them, but, you know, you've got a continuum. So everybody is on this continuum somewhere. It could be that they're here. And not differentiated at all. And that looks like only assessments being at the end. It means no formative assessments, no informal assessments. Only one kind of assessment. Teacher always um, directing what the students do. Um, instruction is always whole class. Uh, teachers talk about covering material. Um, they look at intelligence as just one way. Um, so it's just all very teacher-centered, whole group-centered, but when you get over here to fully differentiated, that means that assessment is always going on constantly. They do diagnostic assessment, maybe giving pre-tests at the beginning. Um, teacher uh, will uh, do some scaffolding to gradually release that responsibility to the students instead of always being the one in charge. Um, flexible grouping, um, using varied materials, recognizing that there's lots of different ways to be smart and lots of different talents. Um, time flexibility and thinking about their needs. Um, and so, and thinking about grading based on learning goals rather than some crazy grading scale. It really not and doing anything so you know if you think about the different teachers that you've had you know where have different ones been on this continuum and I've shown this to a lot of different classes and I believe I showed it to you in a previous video um, this is the cone of learning I really love it because you really see that it's the it's the getting the students getting involved and in actually experiencing the learning where most of what they remember uh, takes place. And a real good example of this is that if you ask a grown-up about their memories from elementary school, they'll talk to you about the programs they were in, the, the games they played in, uh, out in recess. Uh, they'll talk about lunch. They'll talk about, you know, remember, I remember art projects that I did. I remember music programs I participated in. I swear, I don't remember um, anything necessarily that we read in a, in a reading book. Uh, I remember uh, reading A Bridge to Terabithia as a class, and we had a lot of learning experiences with it. Um, I remember that we did, um, in my, one of my fifth grade classes, we, we all got eyeballs from cattle. <laughs> And had little razor blades, and we cut them. This is just crazy, I know. But boy, do I remember that. That was that was a real learning experience to cut into that eyeball. So um, it's just really amazing how true this is. So when we're differentiating, we're not just coming up with a different thing for every student to do. That's not what it's about. It's about just using a variety of strategies that are, is going to help everybody 
being aware of not just what your students are bad at, but being aware of what they're good at. And when that awareness of their strengths, um, you know, their strengths can build up, uh, help them with their needs. Thinking about supports, uh, being aware and anticipating of what kind of misconceptions are going to uh, occur and what kind of stumbling blocks you might you might have in learning and what you can do um, to support that, to prevent that from being such a problem. So we're not just thinking about those students with IEPs and 504. So believe it or not, there was a time when there was no such thing as an IEP or a 504, but we still had students who were at risk. And so um, we just now have this, and some people think that we only differentiate for them. And uh, uh, heavens to Betsy, I hope that that's not what you're doing. You need to be helping all learners. There are gifted students whose uh, talents are going to go to waste. And I often tell the students that I teach that, in my opinion, the most wasted natural resource in the world is intelligence. Um, there's so many gifted students who, who never... Um, get inspired to use their talents. Human resource is the most wasted resource in the world. Um, but that's another story. We're thinking of struggling readers. Uh, we're thinking of students who are at risk. Either they're homeless or they're um, maybe uh, they have a parent who's um, in prison. They, they may be uh, are hungry, uh, poverty. Uh, English is second language, uh, learning styles. A lot of people don't like to talk about learning styles. I do because I think that when you talk about learning styles, then you're thinking about a student's strengths and interests, and that's important. So, you know, I don't care if people believe that these exist or not. I think that, that what we can get from that is all good. It's not going to hurt anything. Multiple intelligences, again. This is just a way of getting to know your learners, what they prefer, how they learn best, or how they feel that they do, uh, make them enjoy learning more. Academic gaps, as you have students, you know, who who have truancy problems, you have students who have been sick and miss, miss some school, sometimes you have students that miss a whole year of school. Well, what do you do about the, the little girl who's had cancer that comes back after being out for three months of chemo? So, you know, these are all some considerations. So when we talk about differentiation, differentiating instruction, there are some things to consider. For one thing, we need to always think in terms of respectful tasks. Respectful tasks, um, we call this respectful differentiation. So if you find, for example, that you have, you've got um, a non-reader in your English classroom and you're teaching fifth grade, you don't want to give that non-reader a first grade version of the story that you're reading. That's not respectful. We need to remember you need to give them the support they need to be able to do what everyone else is doing. You want to give them something that's appropriately challenging, not Dick and Jane. That's not going to do it. The, the curriculum needs to be high quality for all students. It needs to be challenging for all students. It needs to be engaging for all students. You want to have um, uh, just making sure that they're not uh, just left up to doing just first grade work or second grade work or uh, doing some kind of ridiculous sorting project, that sort of thing. I've heard some real special ed horror stories of going into um, high school special ed classrooms, and these students, you know, are just sitting there putting, you know, butts and uh, nuts and bolts together, and um, they're not really learning to do anything useful. We talk about flexible groups. Um, that means, you know, that. We don't always think, okay, this is this is what group you're going to be in, and that never changes. You want to make sure that you have um, assessments that are ongoing all the time. And talking a minute about 
uh, differentiating by content, process, and product, and students thinking about their readiness, their interest, and their learning profile. So when you think about this relationship, when teachers prepare, they can think about their content. How can we improve the access to learners to our content? So the, the student can't read the scarlet letter because his reading uh, is not um, at that level in high school. But can you still make that content accessible to him? How do you do that? That's the decision. Um, the process. So you've got a skill that you want to teach. What respectful way can you teach it? And thinking about the readiness and the interests of the students that are going to be in, engaged in that process. And the product. What are some acceptable pieces of evidence for whether or not a child, um, a student, has uh, mastered the learning goal? And as far as students are concerned, we do have to consider their current skill level, their interest, and their learning profile, the things that they enjoy doing, the ways that they prefer learning. What does this look like in the classroom? So <clears throat> your target group, it would be the group that your standard is written for. So you have a third grade standard for um, math, um, and that that third grade standard for, for math is written for a particular group of students that, you know, have been on grade level and still remain on grade level. That's your target group. And then you've got your other groups in your class. You maybe have an IEP student. You might have some unmotivated learners. You might have some struggling readers. So say this was my class and I was a, teaching a history class. The content that I'm going to teach is the Holocaust. And there's no reason why all of these learners couldn't learn about the Holocaust. So I don't need to um, do anything different here. Uh, everybody's going to learn the same content, right? But the process of that might look a little different. My target group... Um, I can do lecture and reading material, photographs and discussion. But my struggling readers, they they probably are going to need lecture with guided notes and maybe some paired reading. My unmotivated learners, they're going to need naughty goats. Naughty, naughty goats. <laughs> they're going to get. They're going to need guided notes as well. Whoops. And. <clears throat> Small group instruction, excuse me, discussions to keep them motivated. More high interest photos and videos. Some preferential seating. My EP student, I need to, you know, do any kind of number of things, but also making sure that I address the IEP. And my product can change. So this would be the product, a choice, a, a product for the, the target group. Uh, I might make this a choice of products so that my struggling readers and my unmotivated uh, learners all have a way of demonstrating their mastery of the content. You can start thinking about a differentiation <clears throat> in a number of ways. Um, if you definitely can start thinking about it by just trying different methods and strategies, materials, then adding in some modeling, some movement, art, music, demonstrations. The idea is to just try something, do something different. Think of a different approach. The worst thing you can do is to teach it the exact same way. If the students aren't getting it the, the way you're teaching it, they're not going to very, very likely to get it the next time if you continue to teach it that way. You've probably already seen some of these things in a classroom. These are great strategies that are helpful to many different types of learners. So 
differentiation the the what my biggest advice is is that start with something that's easy to incorporate it's only important that you get started on that continuum of differentiation look at what you are doing and think about what you could add one of the things that you do as a teacher is get better you get better every year that you teach so you take the lessons that you've taught in previous years and don't just keep pulling out the same stuff look at it add to it change it and say ooh that's not right i have to do this all the time and it keeps me working like crazy but you know that's <laughs> that's the job and even though um it's not as fancy as what you might find on pinterest sometimes just using a paper bag um for some of your activities uh is better than some fancy thing that you might get at a party supply so always look for low prep activities because the less preparation you have to do to get it ready and the less uh, work you have to do in getting it set up and cleaned up the more likely you are to actually incorporate it in your in your lesson because let's face it you're you're busy as a teacher so here low prep differentiation high prep so this is just a really great example of things that you can just do immediately immediately you could do um, giving students an option of working alone or together um, so these are just low prep and then these are high prep um, that would that are great strategies but they take some time to put together so something that you might do uh, as you as you become a teacher is to think in terms of of just starting out your first year with your low prep uh, differentiation and about every uh, month or so add in something that's a little higher prep but don't kill yourself with trying to do high prep differentiation um, right away from the very beginning you'll burn out learning styles like I said what I like about the discussion on learning styles is that we talk about a preference that might make students much more comfortable in the classroom more likely to be engaged and so for me for example I was never very good at listening now, that doesn't mean I can't learn by listening I certainly do and I certainly learn with when music is involved but the best way is for me to see something or to do something um, and so there are some people who like to talk with others while they're while they're learning they like they like to group work they like partners and there's others of you and I bet you there's some of you right now who are watching this video that really can't stand to work with other people they annoy the heck out of you and because of that you're more of a, a solitary um, multiple intelligences a little bit different you got some who who actually we're talking about some some talents here um, and more for example I loved this people who just seem to be really good at reading other people and so like their interpersonal intelligence they're really good at picking up other people's feelings and needs and intrapersonal intelligence that's you know people who seem to understand their own feelings and needs so this is something that's really good uh, to look at you should stop at any point and take screenshots of these um, to, in order to add to your collection so for example if you have someone who is very um, strong and interpersonal then they're going to be able to learn real well with board games cooperative groups interviewing think pair share but you got somebody who is um, verbal and linguistic they're going to like writing and speaking they're going to love tongue twisters just a lot of good stuff here visual spatial people like me we like maps charts diagrams graphic organizers photographs yeah i get all excited about those things um here's some more so this is some questions that you can ask yourself so you how can i use um how can i incorporate living things natural phenomena or ecological awareness how can i bring music into my lesson 
How can I involve the students in movement? So these are some questions that you can ask yourself when you're looking at your learning objective and planning your lesson. Um, some other ideas. So you have the type of intelligence, spatial, for example, um, activities that the teacher might uh, plan, materials that you might use, instructional strategies. These are all very good in helping you think of ways um, to uh, spruce up your instruction to meet the needs of many different types of learners. Here's some more. Uh, this is great. This is a product grid, which I think is pretty cool. So you've got, um, you want to think about you're trying to think of, okay, well, you know, you hit those points sometimes when you can't think of anything. You think, well, I know they could do uh, an essay or they could do a presentation and then you're just like stuck and you have no idea of anything else they could make. Well, here's some suggestions. I love it. A diorama, a collage. They could make, um, write a, a fairy tale or a family tree. It's all kinds of cool stuff. But really, when it comes down to it, you've got to, you've got to know your learners. Um, and if you don't know your learners, then that's going to be your biggest problem. And right now, um, if you're, you might be a, a student uh, who's learning how to write lesson plans in one of my classes, take, watching this, and you may not have uh, learners in which to use to get to know. But this is a good exercise once you do have a classroom. Start writing down the names of the students and just start making a list of everything you know about that student. So, first of all, you've got a list of students whose specific needs that are obvious. Um, you've got students with the, uh, they're in IEPs, they have 504s. It might be an AP honors class or a medial class. Those things are, are obvious. You also start thinking about other subgroups. Showing readers, academic gaps, unmotivated learners, those students who are gifted, consider their, um, their social situation. Are they homeless, poor, hungry when they get to school? You can assume that all learning preferences uh, and multiple intelligences are going to be within any given population. So let's pretend this is your class. Let's move me up here. Let's say this was your class. How would you describe these learners? What does, what do these people like to do? When these people read, where do they want to be? What are they happy doing compared to what are these folks happy doing? Can you think of some ways that some of the ch these children might need assessments modified? How about this guy? Or this fella? What are some ways that these students might need to be supported in your lesson? Mm, this girl right here, does she need some support? Is this a photo of a teacher who has differentiated or someone who's thinking about differentiation? I don't know. What do you think? So your homework is going to be to use this fictional class and you're going to pull out the templates on D2L. You're going to use this fictional class to help you complete these sections of your lesson plan. Knowing your learners, assessment evaluation modifications, meeting individual and group needs, and the instructional procedures. The remaining parts uh, should be, you know, already done. You're just going to copy and paste those from the last assignments, and then you just want to um, skip the grayed out areas. So for this part right here, you're going to um, Describe the fictional class that's up here. Be creative and think about the strengths and needs of these students 
relative to your learning objectives and activities. So we're not just describing the students. We are, but you're describing the students in the frame of what you're teaching. So if you were teaching about um, literacy, uh, teaching a literacy objective or a math objective, what you see up here would have some difference. Then you'll come down to this part. This will just be what you've copied and pasted um, from your other assignment and the lesson objectives, curriculum uh, standards, and all that too. You'll complete this section using the fictional class uh, pictured above. This, of course, is just a copy and paste from your last lesson. And then again, you're going to complete these sections here about um, the fictional using the fictional class and this part down here at the bottom also. So your mission, if you decide to accept it, your mission is to help learners have an equitable opportunity to be successful. Go forth and do good. I'll see you soon.